Okay. So today we are uh, officially starting our Veja Govindam series with the topic on Guru. And uh, this topic is important for us to understand because we are going to talk about Adi Shankaracharya Ji's life uh, next week. So today we're just going to lay the foundation for that. So the topic today is Guru. Now in Hinduism, we find this very unique uh, thing that there are, there is a, a person or a presence in someone's life and it's considered so important. What is this presence in our lives? So first, let's understand the broader picture. When a uh, brahmachari, when somebody gets initiated into the path of spirituality, they are told to drop all attachments to this world. And, uh, you know, you cannot just let go of all attachments and not hold on to anything. Spiritual life is about detaching from the lower by attaching to the higher. And so new initiates are told, detach from all the lower tendencies, all the lower things, but keep these three attachments. So what are these three attachments? These three attachments are God, Guru, and our scriptures. So when anyone takes uh, a serious uh, role or serious uh, path in spirituality, they are told to keep these three attachments, God, Guru, and our scriptures. We've, talk, we've talked about our scriptures before. So today we're gonna talk about Guru. And in Bhaja Govindam, we will see the role of God. So what is a guru? So there's this famous verse. It says, Gukaraha and the Karascha. The guru is composed of two syllables, gu and ru. Gu, that syllable, means andakara. It means darkness. Rukara stan nirodha krit. Ru, that syllable ru, symbolizes the one who removes that darkness. So when you put gu and ru together, it means that person who removes darkness. And that darkness that we're talking about is ignorance. So we see today there's many gurus that we find, right? There's like a sports guru, there's a tech guru, there's a gym guru, there's a dietitian guru. Uh, and this word guru has now gained such a modern context. So we use it very, you know, very loosely. But what we're talking about specifically is that guru who removes this ignorance, who removes this ignorance about who we are. What does that guru have to be like? Because now we also see that there's many fake gurus. <laughs> Isn't it? There's many people in there posing to be gurus on YouTube, wanting to make something, wanting to do something. What is that guru? like or supposed to be like so first i will read some a verse in viveka churamani and then we will see each definition of what that guru is supposed to be like and then we will see if we we really need a guru so in viveka churamani one of the works by adi shankara chayaji the first thing he says is shrotriya the two when we look at Guru, the two main qualifications are Shrotriya and Brahmanishta. So we'll talk about these two first and then we'll look at the other qualities. Shrotriya means that Guru has to be able to communicate the Shastras because they have to be able to, number one, understand the whole Shastra, the whole essence of the Shastra. It's not somebody who just read something and can speak about it. It's somebody who's really studied and knows the essence of the Shastra. And not only that, knows to how to communicate that Shastra, knows how to put it in words, in very clear words. And number three, who knows the mind of the student. Because if we just communicate what's there in Shastra without understanding What's the mind of the student and where the student's coming from? There will be a mismatch. 
<laughs> it will be like an email that's sitting out on the outbox. <laughs> Everything's communicated, but it's not able to send. You can't send it because it, there's no match to that mind. So that Shrutriya means that Guru has to know how to take that Shastra and bring it to the current mind and speak to that mind, but more so speak to that heart. The second most important characteristic is the Guru has to be Brahmanishta. Brahmanishta is the Guru has to be practicing what they are sharing. It cannot be that the Guru is not living what they have learned because then there will be a, a what do you call this? There will be a very, very wide gap. And we can only be clear about what we, about the truth if we're living it, <laughs> right? Just like I can explain to you how to make dal chaval if I really make it. <laughs> but if I don't make it, I wouldn't know what to tell you. I'll say maybe I think you should soak dal, maybe it should be overnight. I don't know, it depends on what dal. I'll be so unclear. We will be so unclear if we don't live whatever we're talking about. So that guru has to be living it as Brahmanishta. So the two main qualities are Shrotriya and Brahmanishta. What are the other qualities that the guru has? So we can see in Adi Shankara Chayaji's Viveka Churapani, he says that Nirindana Ivanalaha, like a fire without fuel, which means that this guru has no agenda. The guru is not uh, <clears throat> wanting a whole, wanting to build a whole discipleship around them or wanting to gain lots of uh, wealth for themselves, for their comfort or, you know, a big name in society. That's not the interest of a guru. The guru is supposed to be one whose desires have gone, that there's no more, nothing lighting them up. If at all they're working, if at all they're reaching out, if at all they're asking for support, it's because of the welfare of all. But they should not, and they should not be asking for anything for themselves. Their only concern when they look at us is our own evolution and our growth. That's all. That's all they're thinking about. They look at us and they see, how can this person grow? How can this person evolve? There's nothing else. And the question might come, why? Why if, if a guru has realized the truth, why are they interested in our growth? Ahetu kadaya sindhu. They are that ocean of causeless compassion. You see, why the guru will take us on or will guide us or lead us Number one is because the guru has felt, now I have gone through that path. I have gone through that path and I've experienced so many things and I'm seeing this person who's sad, who's, who's having challenges, who's facing some difficulties. So therefore, I, I know what that's like. Let me go and help. That's all. It's just that compassion that's there. Or what we also find in a guru is that a guru also had a guru. All gurus had gurus, right? So Gurudev also had guru. And they feel that whatever they've gained from their guru is so priceless. I mean, the knowledge of the self, when somebody reveals to you who you really are and your true nature, how do you repay that back? So one who has come under the wing of a guru also feels like, I'm so grateful that I, do, I don't know what else I can say. I don't know what else I can do. And they feel like their whole lives can just be dedicated to the service of that guru. So that is why they also help us. They also guide us. So this guru is Shrutriya, somebody who knows how to communicate that scripture to the current mind somebody who's established in the truth and sincere, somebody whose desires have, have gone. A guru cannot have any selfish desire, cannot have that. And somebody who's 
compassionate, causelessly compassionate out of their, because of their love. This is a guru. Now, why do we need a guru? <laughs> that question can also come. Why, why do we need a guru? You know, why? I mean, there's scriptures. We can take the scriptures. We had studied the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. We'd studied what they are. Why can't we just take it and read it on our own? It is like this. Let's just say that uh, you're going on vacation, right? It's um, Thanksgiving. Everyone's planning what they're going to do. Hopefully, you know, where am I going to go? You're planning a vacation. So, of course, you, you think about a place and you find a resort. You find a resort somewhere. Let's say Turkey. I'm just giving an example. <laughs> like in Turkey or um, in Morocco. Let's say Morocco. You find a resort. You look it up. And then you go to the Lonely Planet, right? Because you want to see all the reviews, where to stay, where what to do. You know, is it kid friendly? How much is it going to cost? And you look at all these reviews. And although you can see all of this in a website, and there is Lonely Planet, there's Yelp, there's all of these things. But to have a live person who's actually been there to tell you what it's like, that's priceless. To have a live person to tell you, this is where you should stay. Because this is right near the beach and the view is fantastic. This is where you can get Indian food if you're, if you're missing it. This hotel will be vegetarian friendly. This place will be safe for your children. And you should only stay four days. We stayed seven days, it was too long. To have a live person actually tell you all the intricacies about that place that's suited for you, to have that wonderful experience, that's priceless, isn't it? It's like when you go to a, a museum and when you go to a museum, we have so many museums in New York City, we're blessed, right? We go to a museum and we see so many beautiful paintings, but there's so much we miss. But if we go with a tour guide, we get to know so much more about the painting, about the painter, about the depth, about the colors used, about the time it was painted in. We'll never get that just by us going. Similarly, the guru is our companion in life. There are so many self-help books which will tell us how to live life. But when we have somebody actually there guiding us and saying, this is where we should go. This is how to do sadhana. This is the path we should take. When we have someone guiding us, that's priceless. And the guru guides us in the most important thing. The guru guides us how to exit. <laughs> Many people will guide us in life, where to go, what to do, what course to take, what job, what career to pursue, uh, how to bring up the family. Many people will guide us in that. And that is, that is also good. Guru will guide us how to exit this life, how to exit this birth, how to exit samsara. Gurudev used to always say, our first gurus are our parents, mata, pita. They deliver us in the world. The guru delivers us out of this world. That is the glory of the guru. Now, some might still say, no, but you know, right now we have YouTube. <laughs> we have YouTube. It's pretty sufficient. And it's audiovisual too. I mean, there's sound, there's video, there's movement. I mean, I learned how to make dal also on YouTube. I mean, I know YouTube's pretty good, right? YouTube has quite a bit of stuff. It is true. It's true. You can't underestimate it. But what it has is general advice, general tips what to do for your mindset, what to do for our mindset, for our particular stage in life, for our particular place in life. What is it that we're supposed to do? That advice customized for us, that is from Guru. That's from Guru. Somebody asked Puja Gurudev once, 
why do you need a guru if they're all books? So he said, go ask the book this question. <laughs> go ask the book, right? So that customized for us, for our stage, for our place, that can be given by a guru. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, where is this guru? <laughs> where is this guru? One very important thing to understand is that guru is actually within us. In each of us is guru. But sometimes, in most cases, in most of our lives, we need a physical representation to bring us to the guru within. Because sometimes it's not easy to tap to that depth of us. So therefore, we need that guru in front of us to take us within. And that's why one of the roles of the guru is not only our growth, our evolution, but to make us independent of them. <laughs> no guru wants us hanging around them. They, they want us to, to grow, to evolve and be independent of them. In fact, a true guru wants us to surpass them. It's, it's said that a guru is better than a philosopher's stone. Mm -hmm. Because a philosopher's stone, it touches something and it turns into gold. A guru turns uh, somebody into another philosopher's stone. Mm -hmm. A guru turns somebody else into another guru. Because the guru also wants this parampara or this lineage to continue. So the guru will teach somebody, a shishya or a student, will then hopefully become a guru, will then have a student, who will then become a guru. So it's a lineage of guru and shishya. So all they're trying to do when a guru comes into our life is trying to guide us to that guru within. Now, what does, how does the guru do that? How does the guru, that external guru, how do they guide us to the guru within? We will see, you know, these uh, stories in our Upanishads uh, and our Gita. Uh, there is one story also. We've seen the lives of saints and sages. There's one story of Kabir Dasji and a prince of Bukharo. Now, this prince of Bukharo, once he was in his palace and he was very much into wealth, you know, he was very much into luxury and pleasure and wealth. And he used to sleep in a bed of roses every night. So one night before he was going to sleep, uh, he saw, uh, he heard something in his rooftop. And he heard noises in his rooftop. And what was there was, there were these people looking for camels. And so he's, he's thinking, okay, why are you looking for camels on my rooftop? Is it possible for camels to be on my rooftop? And they looked at him, they said, it is just as it is impossible to find camels on your rooftop, it is impossible to find the truth of life while sleeping on your luxurious bed of roses. And that gave him such a hard, you know, knock. It just, just knocked him. He said, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? And immediately at that point in time, he left. He left and he heard about Kabir Dasji. So he went to Kabir Dasji's home. He knocked on the door. He said, I want to learn this truth. I, I, I want to learn about life now. Kabir Dasji said, I'm a weaver. You're a king. We're two different people. <laughs> Go back to your kingdom. He said, no, 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 I want to learn. So Kabir Dasji's wife, her name was Loy, came and said, she said, why don't you give him a chance and see? And so the king came and lived with Kabir Dasji. And for six years, this king lived. What did Kabir Dasji teach him? Zero. <laughs> Zero verbal teaching. He put him to work. He said, gather firewood, clean the house, 
you know, garden, create the plants, cook food. He put him to immense work. So this king was subject to a life of discipline, utter discipline, waking up early, getting to work, and this couldn't complain. You can't complain. I remember even with us, if we complained, Swamiji would be like, oh, he wants to go home. <laughs> we could not complain. Like, you cannot complain. So I couldn't complain. And six years passed like this. He was just working. And uh, Kabir Dashi's wife said, I, I think he's ready for six years. This king has been with us. He's lived like us. Kabir Dashi said, no, not ready, not ready. She said, what do you mean? He said, do this, go to the rooftop. And when you're sweeping, when you see this king walk on the road, you know, drop all the sweepings on his head. And she said, okay. So she went and she was sweeping the rooftop and she dropped all the sweepings on his head. And he looked up and he was so angry. He said, if this was Bukaro, this would have never happened. Nobody would dare to do this to me. And so she reported to Kabir Dasji and he said, I told you, not ready. And so again, he was put to work. Again, he was put to work for another six years. And the six years passed. And she said to Kabir Dasji, don't you think it's time? And he said, test him again, see? And so she goes to the rooftop and she takes the sweeping, she's sweeping. And she waits for him to pass on the road and she drops it on his head. And he says, thank you. That's exactly what I needed for my ego. And so she tells Kabir Dashi and he says, he's ready, he's ready. And so he sits down and Kabir Dashi gives him the upadesha or the teaching. And the king leaves and goes back. But he doesn't go back to his kingdom. He goes back and he sits by the bank of a river. And he too is weaving. <laughs> he too is sewing. And it so happened that one of his ministers found him there and said, you, we were looking for you. And he said, I know now what life means. And I'm very happy here. This is all that I need. And that's how he got the teaching. This is what a guru does. A guru puts us to work. <laughs> we might think that the guru has no business just putting us to work, telling us do this, do that, give us so many tasks. And we might feel like that, but it's actually for our own growth. When we were, uh, when we were in Chennai, we were put to so much work. I had never worked like that in my entire life. <laughs> Lie from morning to afternoon to evening every day oh so many hours back to back and 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 just as you finish one project you think you're gonna be able to breathe and Swamiji's like okay next project <gasps> you're like, okay <laughs> you're barely breathing and at that time you don't understand what's happening but so much cleansing is happening in one's heart you don't even know but it's happening. It, we're thinking, he's teaching us how to be so selfless, how to stop thinking about ourselves, how to keep the vision above all, all the times, how to make proper decisions, how to be so disciplined, how to be on time. It's that kind of training. And this is what the guru does. They take the mind of the student. They tune with that mind, see where the student is. And then accordingly tell them, to do this this was the tradition that we came from even in one of our upanishads in our prashna upanishad uh, several students came to a rishi and they said we want to learn from you we want to learn the truth he said go serve serve for one year serve for one year after one year you can ask me a question he didn't even let them ask questions after one year you can ask me a question and if I know the answer, I'll answer. This is how they were trained. So that's what the guru does. They take our minds and help purify it. 
to be fit vessels for this truth. Now the question is, when will this happen to me? <laughs> when can I uh, be associated with such a guru? Will, when will such a person ever come to my life? And so Adi Shankaracharya writes this very beautiful verse. It's in Sanskrit. I'll read it to you in Sanskrit. And then I'll explain to it in English. He says, Janmane kashatai sada dharayuja bhaktya samaraditaha bhaktir vedika lakshane na vidhina santushta isha swayam sakshat shri guru pamedya kripaya drigochara samprabhu ho Tatvam sadhu vishodhya tarayatita samsara dukkarnavad. So what this verse says, it's a very beautiful um, combination of even what Swami Tapuvan Maharaj has told us. When Bhagavan is pleased with us, after years and years of and lives even, after lives and lives of our own spiritual practice and effort, what we call Atma Kripa. So along with this verse, I'm going to explain to you the four graces that we all strive for, okay? The four graces that we all strive for because it's very much in mind. So the first grace is called Atma Kripa. And this is the first line of this verse where the seeker spends lives, years working on themselves, working on themselves, doing their spiritual practice, practicing a life of dharma, practicing a life of dharma, of discipline, of service, and of worshiping the Lord. When this happens, this is called Atma Kripa, when I can make myself available for spirituality, that's called Atma Kripa. Because not everybody can do that. Sometimes we're all just stuck in our own lives of, of, of pleasure, of pursuit, of, of more and more things, of more and more wealth and fame and social life. And we're stuck in that. We can't even make ourselves available for spirituality. When we do that, that's called Atma Kripa. We made ourselves available. What happens then? God is pleased. And that's called Ishwara Kripa. God is pleased with us. That's Ishwara Kripa. When we live our lives rightly, dharmically, and God is pleased, Ishwara Kripa, how do we know God is pleased with us? How do we know? Sakshat Sri Guru Rupa Medya Kripaya. That God comes himself, herself as Guru. That Bhagavan comes as Guru. That one of the avatars of Bhagavan is Guru. So straight for us to see, Drigochara, that Guru comes into our life. So we know that God is pleased with us when we have the presence of Guru. And as I said, remember, Guru is within, ultimately within. But sometimes we need an outer representation to turn us within. So we know when God's pleased with us because we get guru in our lives. And sometimes for some people, uh, like for, for us, our gurus, Guru Dev, for some people, um, they may take the form of Bhagavan, form of God as their guru. For, for some people, they'll take like Guru Granth Sahib, they'll take that as guru, right? So that presence will come into our life. That presence will come into our life. Then, how do you know that that guru is pleased with you? So the third is the, the grace of the guru. How do you know that guru is pleased with you? The fourth line of this verse, the guru gives you shastra. Shastra kripa. Kripa means grace. The guru gives you that Vedantic teaching. We are very lucky because 
now we're all getting the teaching. <laughs> we're all getting the teaching. But back in the day, they had to work so much, serve so much just to get this teaching. The Guru gives us Shastra, the scriptures, the essence of the scriptures. And how do we know that we have received the grace of the Shastra when we realize the self? This is our life. It's a life of four graces. First one is Atma Kripa, our own self-effort. When we worship God, we get Ishwara Kripa, the grace of God. God is pleased with us, we get Guru. That grace of Guru enters our life. When Guru is pleased with us, we get Shastra, the grace of Scripture. The teachings of Scripture become alive in our life. And when the teaching of scriptures become alive in our lives, then we are able to realize this truth. So this is the, the place of our guru. And the place of our guru is, is very high in our, uh, in our tradition. And, and I'm sure you, you all have know this Doha that Kabir Das Ji, you know, says that if Guru and God were to come in front of you, uh, who would you bow down to? And he says, mm. I would bow down to Guru because Guru has revealed to me about God. And so, you know, we, we, when this question was put into our, our Guruji, said, Guru and God come in front of you. Who would you bow down to first? And he says, nobody needs to ask that question because Guru themselves will bow to God. <laughs> Guru themselves will bow to God. Hmm? Which is such a beautiful thing. And in our Advaita Vedanta, it is said, Ishwara Guru Atma Iti. God, Guru, and the self are one. They are one. Just their forms appear different, but in essence, they are one. And as our scriptures, the, our scriptures themselves tell us, after you realize the truth, you can be independent of us because you will be the living truth. So too, the guru says, after you've realized the truth, please be independent because you then are the living truth. So that is the beauty of the guru. Now, so we've seen what is a guru. We've seen who is a guru. We've seen why a guru is important. We've seen where the guru is. We've seen when this guru comes into our life. Now we will just look briefly at uh, our parampara, our lineage of gurus. And then we look a little bit about the student, okay? So the lineage of gurus, in Advaita Vedanta, there's one, you know, some, we can look at it in two ways. One is there's this famous verse that says, Sada Shiva Samaram Bham, Shankara Acharya Madhyamam, Asma Acharya Paryantam, Bande Guru Paramparam. Parampara means a lineage. As I said, it's a succession, it's a system. You know, there's a beauty when things are passed on from system to system. When you go to a Vaidya or an Ayurvedic doctor who has learned from their parents, their parents, their parents, it's a very beautifully, beautiful handed down thing. It keeps it very pristine. Uh, even our uh, pickle or our dish, you know, it's from our grandma, from our great grandma, from like that. There's like a lineage to that, you know, there's a lineage to everything. So here, one, you know, one way we can look at it, it starts from Sada Shiva, Lord Shiva. Then uh, we say after that is Adi Shankara Acharya Ji, who we will be studying about in Bajra Govinda. Then to our Guru Parampara. So sometimes we say that it comes about in this Parampara. There's also a verse that says, Narayana Padma Bhuvam Basishtam. It says it, the Guru, first Guru, Adi Guru is Narayana. Then Brahma, Brahmaji, then Vasishta. I'm sure you've heard of these names before. And after that, Vasishta's son, Shakti, 
then his son Parashara, then we have Gaudapada, Govindapada, Adi Shankaracharyaji, and so forth. So we will see that we have this lineage of Guru and Shishya. When you look at this lineage of Guru and Shishya, traditionally, um, sometimes you might always think, okay, is it always that, is it always a single person, a guru? Or is it only a maid who is a guru? Or is it only an Indian who is a guru? Uh, that is not true in our tradition. Even married, married couples are gurus, can be guru. Even uh, women are guru. Uh, there's a, a profound, uh, a very beautiful example, Ananda Maima. Uh, she's, she's no more now. But uh, she was married and she was, a, a, she, although she doesn't consider herself a guru, but she was a, a saint of the highest order. Huh? So she is, was a guru to many. Uh, also people, it doesn't have to be that you're only Indian, that you guru. No, people also of different cultures, different races, they also can be guru. Uh, and in fact, we are so fortunate today that in Chinmay Mission, uh, Swami Chinmay Nandaji, Puja Guru Dev has established Sandipani Sadhanalaya, where you know I was fortunate enough to study, open to men, women of all religions, all cultures, all traditions. This teaching is made available to them if they want to really learn and honestly live this life. So that is the Guru Parampara. That's the glory of now, we're going to talk a little bit about the student because we are all students. <laughs> we are all students. And to be able to deserve a guru, first we have to be fit students. So what is that fit student? I'm going to read to you a mantra from Mundaka Upanishad that tells us what a fit student is. And this is this also ties in very much with Bhaja Govindam, what we're going to be doing in that text. The mantra goes like this. Pariksha lokan karma chitan brahmana nirveda maya nastya krita kritena tadvignyanartham saguru meva bhigachi samit pani shrutriyam brahmarishtam says the ideal student to approach the guru is one who has done pariksha. Pariksha means to examine life. Somebody who has seriously, sincerely examined life, that person is fit to approach the guru. What kind of examination is to be done? Pariksha Loka means examining the world. Not that I tried so many different things and nothing worked, therefore let me go to a guru. <laughs> I tried a career and it didn't work. I tried to serve here, it didn't work. I tried having a family, it didn't work. So let me just go to a guru. Maybe that will work. Not that kind of Pariksha. When we say Pariksha, what we mean is that examination which comes out of maturity that we have examined the world and we have seen its limitations. We've seen the limitations of the world that it's, and this is something that you and I have to come to ourselves, that it's, it's essenceless. Essenceless in the sense that we keep hoping to find something deeper and deeper and deeper. We keep unwrapping different things, unraveling different things, trying different experiences, hoping to somehow find something that will fill us up. But we're not finding it. We're not finding it. We're hoping to find something there that will make us whole, that will make the peace stay there. But we're not finding it. So I have seen life. I have experienced life. I've gone through so many things. I'm not finding the essence there. I'm not finding that bliss. I'm seeing that or another limitation could be, I'm seeing that uh, there are things that do make me happy, 
there are things and there are people that make me happy, but they can also be the same cause for my sadness or that happiness is very short lived. So all of these things, it, it's, it's a it's happiness that is dependent. It's dependent on a person. It's dependent on the weather. It's dependent on the time. It's dependent on a circumstance. And I'm seeing there's a limitation where it's dependent. It's not something that's an independent happiness. It's not something that's complete. It's not something that's full. And I'm seeing that there's this limitation. I tried, but I'm not finding what I want. So I looked at this world, I experienced this world, and I found what I need is not found in this world. And so it says here, karma chitan brahmana, like everything that karma can give me is fine, but there's a limitation. And what I need is not in this world. What develops is maturity. And that maturity is seen in the form of vairagya or dispassion. And therefore, they say, you're that student, that ripe student says, what I want is something out of this world, something deeper, something pure. That's what I want. And I'm not going to get it here. For that very purpose, that disciple, Disciple means someone who subjects themselves to discipline, who's ready to subject themselves to discipline. Tadvignyartam, to for gaining knowledge, for the purpose of gaining knowledge, they approach the guru. And in the olden days, how they used to do this was they used to carry wooden sticks to approach the guru. And what this meant was, this is my ego. These wooden sticks are my ego. I'm ready to burn them in the fire of knowledge. So they would go carry these sticks to the guru. So guru meva bhikachit. Samit pani, holding this in their hand, to the guru who is shrutriya and who is brahmanishta. That is the kind of student who approaches the guru or who is ready for the guru. And so what we will find in Raja Govindam is this, uh, it's, it's all doing a pariksha. All the 31 verses, as we start, we will see, are all examinations of life. Seeing the limitations of life and making us turn to seeking something higher. Okay? So I'll just summarize and then maybe we'll have a few questions or uh, we'll see if anyone wants to share some thoughts about this. So today, what we saw is a very beautiful topic uh, we have in Hinduism, and that topic of a guru. A guru is the remover of ignorance, the ignorance of the self specifically. And that guru must be shrutriyam and brahmanishtam, means somebody who can communicate the scriptures to our mind, and somebody who is established and rooted in that. And a guru is also somebody whose desires for the world have gone away. Their only interest is our evolution and our growth. And blessed are we when we come under such beings who just care for our evolution. And why they help us is because they feel indebted towards their guru. And also because they feel compassion towards us, seeing how we are now. They see that that's where they were once before. And where can we find such a guru? That guru we can find inside of us. Huh? And when we, uh, when we approach a guru, what does that guru do? They cleanse us. They discipline us. They really do everything possible to get that mind to be pure and sattvic so that it becomes ready to receive that knowledge. When does that happen? That happens when we ourselves have put forth a lot of effort in our lives, have, have worshipped God in several ways, have done our dharma, have lived rightly. That Bhagavan will come in the form of Guru. And uh, who is that fit student to, to take on or to, to approach that guru, one who has done pariksha, 
What am I examining this world thoroughly? Okay, so I'll stop here and uh, record this. The vessel that we need to gain knowledge is a pure mind, okay? So sometimes we think ignorance is binary. The vessel we need to gain knowledge is a pure mind. And now, so what's happening? What's happening in all of our Vedanta satsangs, right? What's happening is knowledge is being given. Knowledge is being given. But that mind is not exactly purified to a great extent. All of our minds, all of our minds are not purified to a great extent. So although we hear that knowledge, it doesn't seem like it's removing ignorance. It doesn't seem like that. Right? It doesn't seem like it's removing ignorance. But what's happening is that knowledge is creating an impression. And even in these satsangs, in these settings, the mind is slowly, slowly becoming pure. So the knowledge is there, but it's not sinking in. It's not going in. It's not seeping in because the vessel is not purified enough. When, when they say knowledge happens in an instant, what happens is knowledge happens in an instance for one who has a pure mind. For one whose mind is very pure and still, knowledge takes place in an instant. You are Brahman, that's it. There's nothing more needed to say. But for many of us, because there's so many uh, what we call negative vasanas or negative habits, there's a lot of cleansing that has to happen for that knowledge to actually really, really settle and sink in. And when it does, that's the removal of 